Any specific questions for Chris? <laughs> Sure. I don't know if this is, a, this is more of a provocation than a question. I know. Yeah. <laughs> sure I know it's coming. Um, I think the issue is uh, understanding statistical mechanics, and I don't want to go into that in, deep, in depth, but at the time the Zanakis was studying, he's studying st statistical mechanics as it existed in 1900. It's Boltzmann statistical mechanics, and it's the theory of heat. Yep. And the problem is that, as you kept saying, the similarity or, of components. Now, but you can see the systems he built, the structures are symmetrical. Yep. And the problem is symmetrical systems don't create order. That is, if you have a bunch of things which are all the same and they're all just there, you have a gas. And gases don't do anything except be boring. Okay. Yep. In order to get structure, in order to get a universe, you have to have asymmetry. It's called symmetry breaking. So the issue for, for spontaneous structure is there has to actually be some difference already. And we can't explain where that difference comes from. It's a kind of mystical, cosmological bug in our system. But the thing is, in order to be able to have emergent systems, you have to have, you can look, the best example to look at Stuart Kaufman's attempt is try to figure out how you would get structure for nothing out of just some bits or something like that. And the initial thing is you need asymmetry, which of course we've already got. We're all different, so there's no problem. But the, you can't model this kind of emergent structure without asymmetries. And I think that's important for people to, who are thinking about this to think about. There has to be rule differences or concrete material differences or our kind of easy social differences. <laughs> but that, that's, that's, that's my... Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. Yeah. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how time plays into um, the work. Yeah, um, so, it's, 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 it, so it's always, again, the tension between a, a, a timeline, right? So, for instance, the the companies we're working with, you know, their whole idea of media, right, and their whole idea of experience is a timeline, right? We just have a timeline, and we have some kinds of really basic behavior stuck in the timeline, and then, like, we trigger events, right? And so, the, but of course, you want to compose something. So you want, you want structure, right? You want time, you're looking for something. Latour says non-humans out there, some agency, some of their own predilections, as, as, as Joel was, was saying about this kind of uh, question of, of, of asymmetry. So um, we're trying to work with both. We're trying to work with something which is structured over time, but that at times also, given certain windows, uh, has a, an elastic quality to it. So the time is produced in the system. In the, and so we're talking a lot about like the, the qualities of light we have, for instance, like have different types of time constants. So LEDs have a very different uh, color temperature curve, right, and also brightness curve than xenon strobes, which you have to fire once or twice. You know, you have to fire and then wait for them to recharge. And that's really interesting because Zanakis had the problem in Paris where he could not fire the strobes until he waited two seconds after each one. So they had to figure out how to group things so they would fire. And we have the same problem, even though we're using really you know, cheap strobes that, that get because of the capacitance. You know? So there's already a natural time built into the kinds of lighting systems we're using. You know? um, and we're also hoping to see what happens with sound, that, 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 that the same kinds of, because we're thinking about this kind of you know, swarm behavior as with many, many, many speakers, as well as the room system. So that there's also given, giving that, those systems their own kind of their own kind of time. So it's this struggle right now. We've actually been looking at the scores because Zanaka's kept the scores separate from the light, right? Completely. He wrote the music, and then, of course, there's clear couplings going on. It couldn't be that he wasn't thinking about you know the certain kinds of where things come together and things then split apart. Um, but we're looking at the scores and then trying to think about, well, what kinds of time, what kind of behaviors happen? So some things are continuous, which when you have a lot of staccato things, gives you the sense that the sound is like a drone, right? And then sometimes we switch and the lights go to LEDs, which have a much longer time constant, and then the sound becomes more pointillistic. So we're trying to give a sense of these two opposing forces switching their, their, their temporal behaviors. You know? We use the word behavior, never, it's never thought about temporally. It's thought about like spa spatial. You know, like I do this and then I do something, but it's all like collapsed into one point in time. 
But actually, you start to bring up these kinds of these kinds of interactive systems. You're actually talking about temporal temporal systems. Right, and you're, you're interacting with something that that changes while you interact. Yeah. The whole idea of growth and I'm, emergence is something that emerges after a while, after a system has gone right. through a period. Right. Right. Sometimes, the, yeah. And, and the question is like, yeah. how long yeah. how long does that last? Does that last in the course of a performance of 30 minutes, yeah. or you know, um, does it last over days? Or you know, some systems exhibit spontaneous order very quickly. You know, some take much longer. So that's the very interesting tension that we're, we're trying to play with. I was just curious, why do you think that he was thinking about the logical aspect of music? What music? Well, when you, do, when you listen to the... So we did an analysis of the Palito uh, Morial, and the, the sound, the, the score sounds very, very complex, but actually when you look at it, it's, it, it's very, very, very structured. Like you can follow, for instance... Um, the way the percussion works. And so the percussion comes in very, very periodic uh, 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 structures. It, even there's a lot of gaps in it. Like it and, you, and you get a sense that listening to that percussion and thinking about, because we also have the score of the lights, you know, thinking about the kind of groups. He was looking at group theory, right? And how these different groups of lights would coalesce or interact with each other. Um, you get the sense that he was, was clearly thinking about the kinds of this kind of breakdown between this pointillistic staccato quality and then this continuous thing. Because the score sounds continuous, but actually there's lots of places in it where you look across the four orchestras and there's a rest on every single line of the staff. You know, so it's really interesting like the way in which certain kinds of instrumentation uh, set up what must have been very, very direct correlations to the light. You know? Even though, again, he says, well, I... Like, you know, it, it's, I think it's different than Cage and Cunningham of saying, okay, I bring the, the score that night of the performance and we have no idea what it's going to do and we just see how they interact. I think Zanakis was much, you know, I mean, he, he had to be. He was looking at probabilities, right? So he had to be aware of this kinds of... He was very much a composer still. Yeah. 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 Any, any other questions? Good. Yeah, just a, a comment, and maybe you've got some some more thoughts on this. Um, you gave the nine model. Um, there's something, a couple of things that are implicit in that model that weren't on your picture. One is that there's a closed feedback loop with the performer. Right. Right. So it's not really just this linear system. You've got right. someone course, driving yeah. it. And the other thing is, like with real instruments, acoustic instruments, there's usually a non-linear boundary between the performer and the instrument. So you can think of the reed in a reed instrument. You, you're blowing into this thing, but you've got this highly unstable absolutely thing that interfaces. Same with if you're bowing a string, and yeah. and or you know the vocal cords. So the performer is working with a, a non-linear system and controlling that. Yeah, um, and I think that's an idea that's pretty kind of well understood in the nine community as well. Uh, so I just yeah, thought a, you could maybe a, talk about that. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a provocation. I mean, it's it's changed more and more, but I, th I think what one idea that still is 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 hangs on is this idea of mapping, you know, and and, and relatively and, simple mapping even. Well, simple yeah, mapping, but times, even like is. if you have a lot of stuff, you know, like it's like well, we just make we just draw lines between parameters, right? But that's like map a map in one point in time. Right? It's not a map that changes. What happens if all those things start to switch? You know, or how do you deal with those those feedback processes internal to parameters, right? Or and how then do you look at the whole? And and that's something that that uh, I mean, this is something Adrian Frieden and I are discussing all the time. You know, because he's also said, well, this, ma this mapping thing doesn't go anywhere. You know, I mean, it goes a certain place, but if you're looking at more complex, in the sense that I talked about complexity, more complex behaviors, um, y y you're going to run into a wall, you know. So it's, like I said, part of a provocation, but it's not just simply with many to many or many to one or one to many. It's really trying to think about what is, if we're interested in, in interesting, like how can we, uh, especially if you have things that, that are not necessarily directed by human performers, right? How do we give a sense of, of an interesting dynamic? People always know that, like, well, in terms of a lot of environments, for instance, the environment seems to feel tired after a few minutes. So, how do you give a sense of dynamic that you sense something's changing, it's structured, but at the same time, it's 
it's new, right? I mean, that's what emergence in some ways is, is like it's always producing somehow the new. Now, there's computational emergence which has a kind of pattern-based way of thinking. You say, well, it's nothing necessarily new out of the pattern, but then there's a whole other kind of emergence, like cellular emergence, for instance, where you actually do produce something something fundamentally new. So it, it, is, it is part of a, a tension of saying, well, this is an established model, and you're right, there's clearly a feedback loop between the performer and the instrument, um, even if you have a non human performing, right? Although it's much more complicated because you don't have the nuance of a real performer, right? You don't have the ears. You don't have this, you have cheap things like sensors that don't have ears that, you know, don't have very sophisticated ways of, of, of analyzing. Uh, and then also responding in, a, in an embodied way. It's time for a break, I think. Yes, um, definitely. But before we go to the break, I'd like to um, ask Stas. Where's the microphone? I'm going to bring up your slide. Can, can, too. can you briefly tell us a bit about what you have and what people can play with? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, excuse me for one minute. I actually need to drink something. I brought some stuff. Uh, I thought I wouldn't use uh, slides and also I figured I ended up in a mid-session so probably best to uh, keep it short and do maybe use objects oh. sorry for a <clears throat> disorganized manner of my presentation so far <laughs> Slides here, but see it. Okay. Um, so my name is Stas de Jong. I'm a PhD student at Leiden University, and this is a Cactus. Um, I'm, I'm very glad to be here today. Thank you. Thank you for your attention right now. Um, I, I'm going to give you a, a sort of brief look into my current research, like what I'm doing in, in my room uh, right now. Um, in general, most of my PhD is about touch and musical interaction. Um, so, uh, but <coughs> I thought since the theme of uh, this session was gardening complexity, I could bring a plant. Uh, um, but actually, what I really wanted to talk about um, was a key question which drives me personally, um, a deep question, I think. What is a musical instrument and what can it be? Now, I'm, I know I'm not the only one here who's interested in that, so... Uh, uh, but if, uh, there's many answers that are possible. Um, so if, if we would have a discussion right now about what is that, what is a musical instrument, um, there's many ways we could go about it. Uh, we could think of instruments we know and try to find general Factors we could think about systems, uh, as in the previous presentations. Uh, but my approach is different right now. Um, I'll just take a random object, this cactus, and ask: Is it a musical instrument? Um, now, I, I promise there's a point to this, uh, <laughs> um, but I can imagine that some of you might say some, you know, say skeptical remarks to me, like there are some uh, crucial aspects missing there. Uh, like, uh, for instance, how do you make sound with a cactus? Uh, if it's a musical instrument, you need sound. Uh, and how are you going to interact with the cactus? Uh, what human actions do you think would work well? Um, <laughs> doesn't look like a pretty picture, I, uh, I must admit. And then there's a, a third important crucial thing uh, which you know may very well be missing, even if it makes sound. Uh, why would that sound be musical or musically interesting or lead to a musical experience in your brain? <coughs> so uh, I'm an optimist, so I would say to my fictive uh, uh, person talking to me, um, well, at least we, we understand more about musical instruments already by talking about the cactus. We identified three key aspects which uh, you say are missing. But I think, in fact, it's possible um, at least to make sound with a cactus. Um, so 
you, you, the cactus has needles, so you can touch one. Is that? Can you hear that? Yes. Um, <laughs> it, it's like a dry, dry click. Right? Right? Yeah. Okay. So, but you can uh, expand on that. You know, be bold. Um, So I'm not sure how interesting that sounds, but... Uh, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lucky. So it, it, it even is a, a little bit like a watery sound, uh, a compound sound emerging from the little brief fragments of, of touching the needles. Um, so, skeptical person, we have two out of three items covered. I got some human actions and I have sound. Um, and then, of course, Somebody could say, well, um, it's a nice sound, but I don't think it's musical. Um, and I would say, yes, it is musical. Uh, and I don't need to prove this myself. Uh, just imagine the little clicks to be any small sound, uh, like a little bell or a very small fragment of vocal sound. Um, and then replace them in your mind with what you just heard. You could have any, uh, well, any kind of sound. Uh, but this is done, uh, and we've already encountered it in uh, Znakis. So uh, uh, he, he did it with, uh, with tapes in the 60s, I guess. Um, small pieces of tape, cutting them up and then connect, reconnecting them with all the small particles of sound. That's how it started. And nowadays, many musicians and compos composers have been using it. It's very successful. Um, so, um, but how, how do you do that? Well, basically, uh, you can't use a cactus. You have to, so if you want to improve on the cactus, you have to replace it um, with a transducer for sound, which is something you can put any signal on. And that's, of course, a speaker. And the other part you need is a computer. Uh, so if you put them together, um, you can do this. <laughs> Um, I promise there's a point to this. <laughs> um, let's see. But first I'll conclude that the cactus is a musical instrument. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm still wondering. <laughs> uh, because we've seen in, in like a, a nutshell how we can improve upon the cactus and make sound, make granular synthesis, all these fantastic possibilities which you can all have in your uh, laptop. But I'm still wondering about the, 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 the touch side. Uh, can we improve on that too? So, well, the logical way to go about that perhaps is not to just compute sound, but also compute touch. So what does something feel like that you can compute that too? But not only what it feels like, but the actual manipulations you can do that they become dynamic, that, they, that you can compute them. Um, well, it may seem a bit far-fetched, but um, the first thing you need to do that is something like a speaker, but for touch, a transducer. So, uh, and that's what my demo is about. So this is something you put on your finger, and it's a transducer for touch, and it's one of my projects. And um, well, if you could check it out, it would be cool. That's what my demo is about. Thanks. Okay, we're, we're running a bit late, which is okay, I think. Uh, we're, not, we're not in a hurry at the end of the afternoon. Uh, yeah, his demo is over there. Go check it out uh, and uh, be amazed, I would say. And it's 10 past 4 now. Let's be...
Thanks. There you go. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank uh, Taku and Stein for inviting us here. And uh, thank you for coming. And I've been invited here also with Sonia as part of uh, Optophonica. So um, I'm mostly going to present the project, the idea, and uh, the works that we do. As, uh, as was said, we have uh, a laboratory which is actually around the corner on the Damarack here. Everybody's welcome to visit at any time. You can just contact us and come over. Because the best way to actually understand what we do is not really this one, but uh, just coming and seeing and experiencing uh, the work. And uh, you will understand maybe by going through this presentation that what I mean with this. And um, I think we've been invited also in this particular uh, talk, uh, a symposium for about complexity, because maybe um, we work on, on some sort of complex kind of systems and uh, concepts, ideas, and contexts too, which is partially true. On the other hand, I mean, I never really think about uh, complexity, otherwise I wouldn't engage in any of my works uh, from the very beginning. But um, um, it's, it's true that we look uh, at some kind of complex uh, phenomena more than like systems or uh, concept and try to somehow activate these phenomena in order to observe them. So we're very interested in, in, the, in the observation of things, and out of that, maybe there is some beauty to appreciate. But um, can we have the slides on the screen? I think. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's very dark. Uh, all right, let's see what goes. So, um, what well, this is just. Quick, uh, briefly, I will go through through the, the Optophonica project. Um, uh, what I want to say is that w the, the project also got into two different stages. So we are now in the second stage of the project. So it was born more as um, uh, a sort of post-media kind of uh, um, project, uh, trying to promote um, what I call those days like synesthetic, synesthetic media and sound specialization was more like how, how to transcend this um, uh, focus on, on the media and technology which was uh, um, in which we had experience anyways with audiovisual performances and uh, Compos generative composition, procedural composition, and com mostly like computer-based or technological-based uh, works, media-based works, into something that you know will go a bit more into the, um, the um, s sensorial uh, mode. So my interest in, in synesthesia actually took me to this path, and um, also my, in my specific interest in sound specialization, which I always thought was much underrated as a, as a, um, as a practice by, by sound artists, you know, who, who are not, uh, who were not in, uh, in uh, research centers, where, of course, there has been a lot of, like, sound specialization uh, research and, and uh, practice, but as a um, diffused practice, I thought it was time to kind of like trying to stimulate more like uh, artists to produce in this sense and not just sound artists but uh, you know all kind of um, all kind of art that will take advantage of the, the uh, possibility of immersing the audience in, in, a, in a sound field rather than having you know just sound projected over stereo or simpler ways however we, uh, so Optophonica is situated in this situation like uh, as um, you know kind of like post media and, and what I call and you will see later like this spectrum sensorium it's just uh, labels we give to this but it's more important what we really deal with and uh, but I'll go quickly through through a bit of story so the, the, the idea was born as a platform so as a way to facilitate 
uh, works to, to also create some sort of context where this idea, this combined idea of synesthetic media and sound specialization will unfold in some way. And um, for this, uh, um, I wanted to, to contact as many uh, artists as possible on an international scale, which happened. Yeah, they, I mean, all the artists responded very well to, to this very simple idea. Okay, how, how do we connect these two things, like synesthetic media and spatialized sound? Synesthetic media is, is, is a little bit different concept than synesthesia as a uh, uh, medical condition, I mean, or, or um, uh, artistic speculation, let's say. But um, I was convinced that the that, uh, that this um, combination would be quite interesting to to explore. So mine was only an attempt to, you know, com convince others to to try something and and to produce something that and see what comes out of it. But it was also my kind of like first more serious approach to more rigorous and. Um, if you want scientific way to, to proceed. And many artists responded, as I said, here is a list, and also many organizations were interested in, in, this, um, in this idea and actually supported the project in different ways. So, and um, one of the outcome of this first stage of the project was an exhibition at uh, NIMCA, Montevideo, here in Amsterdam in 2008 where we had five installations and uh, four performances and the cinema thing. So basically, uh, I started with collecting some material, some audiovisual material, where I uh, suggested the artist to use any technique of sound specialization and finalize it as a surround, not because I believe that surround is a uh, technique of sound specialization, but it was a, a way to kind of diffuse this material in, in an easy way. But um, uh, that's why I also wanted the, the exhibition to take place so that some of this work will really show the potential of, of uh, different ideas and different techniques so that in uh, this, this specific exhibition uh, the the goal to to um, show uh, the relationships between sound space and and perception and um, it worked quite well and also the, the the live performances because each of the installation was basically a sound system of, of some sort the, I thought it was interesting to invite different artists to perform on the different sound systems, so you know you will get the specifications of it, and you will try to do something. So it was very kind of laboratory, experimental, and uh, it was quite successful in my opinion. Uh, this is some uh, video. Of do you have some? Yes. <coughs> I have to go fast over all this. I won't comment much on each work, but um, you will understand that each of these works has to do with, with space and, and the way you perceive actually sound, especially sound in, the, um, in that space. Um, I think, yeah, this was Francisco Lopez performing on, Ar on Arno Jacob's installation, so there was one of these exchanges we did, like this collaboration, let's say. Sonic Bad by Kathy Matthews. Uh, maybe some of you know this work, it's been quite popular. Um, okay. Her um, way to diffuse these ideas was the publication, which took like over three years to collect all the material, prepare it, and, and select it and prepare it for as uh, we wanted. Um, so there is there is a DVD and a book uh, still available. We have a few copies left. It's been pretty much uh, sold out in a very short time. It was only 
thousand copies released by line label in the in the states. Uh, it's still available. If any of you want a copy, just drop me an email and uh, we can send it to you. You can buy. I mean. Uh, one of the things uh, I wanted to do that was connected to this project was, was to, to um, create some uh, environment for actually um, uh, watching and listening to these works because I started collecting all these works. I had this already in mind before, but th then when I really looked at the material, I said, yeah, I really got to do this because it, it's really worth now to, to, to try this out. And um, my idea was like, why should we? It's actually like, it's the same way you have here. Like, and um, um, it's the most common way to show like with the visual material, you have a TV and uh, like maybe headphones. I mean, if, if you're lucky, sometimes it's just the, the monitors from the uh, video, like the, uh, the speakers from the monitors, I mean. Uh, it's ca kind of like poor way to show the, the, the actual potential uh, of, um, of an audiovisual work. So, of course, you have other ways, and there, are, um, you know, there have been many other ways. But I thought it was a pity not to have a sort of a, a more immersive environment to, to and portable environment to show this kind of work. So that was the the, the idea of building it, this kind of uh, structure, like uh, um, this helmet. You would see more pictures like here. Um, that would give um, more um, uh, I would say tactile uh, uh, sensation of, of the sound and uh, a, um, a more kind of panoramic uh, vision. I mean, I, did, I never managed to, to have what I wanted inside as kind of like big panoramic screen kind of thing. So inside the, this, this um, sculpture, there is just a, a flat monitor, but just the distance works well. And the fact that, that the sound um, um, embeds you in this uh, field, is, and uh, you you get you receive sound, low frequency sound from below, from from this platform, this vibrating with the transducer, which is not a, a speaker, it's a magnetostrictive transducer. Same for for this panel. So this is all handmade uh, work, which very uh, was very complex to, 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 to make this uh, and uh, because there was a lot of research on how to make the actual structure vibrate to produce the sound without speakers. So this, this thing doesn't have any speaker. It's just a structure that vibrates and it has five panels. So this round sound that was produced for this uh, audiovisual material was diffused by the vibration of the, of the structure itself. And um, okay, so this this became another way to dif to start diffusing these ideas and these possibilities, and it's been quite a lot around, I, I must say. And um, finally, that that closed actually the the first stage of the project. So um, in in Amsterdam, two of the artists who, who took part to this, to this project, uh, namely Evelina Dominic and, and Dimitri Gelfen. Um, with whom I became very good friend and collaborated, uh, decided with me to kind of change the project into something more uh, active locally in Amsterdam. So and also more uh, oriented to 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 some uh, art science uh, direction. And um, I mean, we um, we decided then to. Um, rent a space in Amsterdam and to start building up some uh, works there and some environment also to to invite people to have to have a more hands-on kind of uh, sessions and environments for for people to work on these things. So it's more like pass, it was a switch, like from this idea of like having many artists from all over the world and uh, trying to connect them to produce things to the, to the idea, okay, we have something here, we, you can come here, like, and we can work together and, and, and make things. And of course, we are also making our own project and collaborate between us. So that's also the case with Sonia, who also came a little later 
became part of the what we call the core group. So the, it's uh, four people for now, but we have many, many collaborators that uh, come and uh, exchange with us. Not just the work, it's not just the, the making the thing, and that's what I, what I think as a laboratory, it's a, it's a place where you meet, you, you work, you exchange ideas, and you try to diffuse also, uh, loca especially locally. That's what we did also with inviting artists and scientists at the lab to meet together in a very informal setting where you can give a presentation and drink some wine and eat some food and really have a, a productive exchange, which is a bit like different from, for example, what, what we are doing now. Uh, it's like you know being behind the desk and talking to you, and it's, there's a bit of a distance now. It's more difficult to, to kind of engage in a more kind of active exchange in this way. Of course, we have questions and things afterwards, and that's that's fine and nice and dandy. But uh, yeah, we thought some other formula could work, and it's actually very it was very successful, and, and um, we had five meetings called Synergetica, meetings between, mostly between artists and scientists where we, we will create this kind of um, easy environment uh, and uh, also present at each occasion anyway a real work. So it's not just, you know, like here talking and presenting some documentation of the work or, but in, like in this case we have a good example, like here there is a real thing and people can go there and experience something. So the, the experiential part of, of these ideas is really fundamental. And um, that's exactly what this text also is saying, which is something we were trying to formulate some ideas around what we're doing. It's always uh, hard and, and uh, difficult to find you know, names and labels for this. Like, so immersive art science was, was one of the things we came up with. But at the end, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter, at least to me personally. For me, it's much more important the kind of work you do. You, you, of course, you have to be able to communicate to others, you know, what you're doing. But uh, I prefer to do it more like on a um, work-based kind of uh, documentation and presentation. However, the the um, the idea of uh, s uh, shifting the, the 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 focus from from the object of art or or whatever you do to the to the um, perception of it was kind of like a key idea of of, of this um, new way of uh, engaging with this an immersive environment is uh, definitely what uh, we think. Uh, we, what we like most to, to, uh, to work with. Um, this was an, uh, a nice quote we found on a book, uh, and um, the, this first one, we found ourselves here on the very path taken by Einstein of adapting our modes of perception, borrowed from the sensations to the gradually deepening knowledge of the laws of nature. This very much reflects what, what is our uh, idea and, and what we really want to do. It's interesting that this was by Niels Bohr in, in 1928 and was reported by uh, Arthur Miller, not the famous Arthur Miller, but is a, another writer and scientist, physicist, and we happened to meet him also not uh, like a few weeks ago. This, the, we took this thing from his book, we didn't know uh, him before, and uh, we found out that we have a lot of uh, points in, of interest in common. And uh, I think uh, this w w expresses very well the direction we're, we're taking in with our work. Um, this is uh, Evelina and Dimitri's most popular work. This, wasn't, this was done before the, the lab was in place, but it's, it, uh, it shows the kind of ideas and, and things we'd like to work on. And um, for those who don't know, this, this piece is um, it's basically a, a pool, a, a vessel with um, a water and, and um, uh, uh, xenon gas or sulfuric acid. It, it depends like from, from the condition. Like There are some things that cannot be taken uh, to the public because they're too dangerous, like some chemical uh, combination can, uh, are not allowed to be uh, brought to the public uh, space, but uh, um, 
there are ways to produce this phenomenon, which is very interesting. It's, uh, it's called sonoluminescence, uh, where a sound, uh, uh, ultrasonic sound, uh, infuses a, a liquid uh, uh, to the point that it creates these bubbles, these waves, this train of bubbles that implode, and when they implode, they emit light. So this is a phenomenon that's been investigated by very few uh, scientists in truth, and they thought at the beginning that it would be a possible source for alternative energy and so forth, which didn't really succeed, but also because they didn't invest enough like in this type of research. Uh, but it's um, the, the ephemeral nature of this work where you need to adapt your sight for some minutes before you actually start seeing what you see here in this video is, is um, it's very peculiar, and uh, it, it brings you really into this uh, almost kind of like dreamy state. You, you're not sure what you're seeing, but you're, you're sure that there's something going on, and this uh, light produced by sound is also very fascinating. And uh, this is another work also uh, related to how sound can produce um, interesting phenomena, you can observe it. You know, some of these phenomena are, are not too difficult to, to activate in a, in a nanoscale or in a very small scale. When you get to, you know, to observable scale, it's kind of tough. Uh, but that's what, what, you, what we try to do. And um, in this case, it's like, uh, it's a piezo transducer, so it's a kind of like piezo speaker that produces a 15 kilohertz sound wave that is reflected from another cylinder from the top, so you create a standing wave in these two cylinders, between these two cylinders, and the standing wave creates uh, anti-nodes, so where the waves cross each other, it's a zero node where actually matter can be trapped not only trapped, but because of the dynamics of the, of the process, it, it spins too. Uh, this has, uh, I mean, this has implications we cannot go through this presentation, but they are, they are, they are very, very interesting on a, on a cosmological level. Like, uh, this is acoustic uh, uh, levitation, and uh, uh, there are theories, for example, where uh, they think that the, the sun would, would act as a uh, source of sound, of vibration, and the whole solar system is a kind of uh, sonal levitation chamber. And if you calculate uh, uh, the, the frequency of, of the this sound from the sun, which corresponds to the, it, its actual mass and diameter, you will have some harmonics and things that correspond to the positions of the planets in our solar system. It's a very interesting coincidence, or it's a very interesting theory that will demonstrate something very important where scientists are still like scratching their head and trying to understand why they're there. So it's a, this is to say you, you can investigate some phenomena at this scale. You can make it also a, a beautiful kind of uh, observatory. So it's uh, each, I would say, each of our artwork is a sort of observatory of some type of phenomena. And so in that sense, you might see it as, as an artwork. At the same time, it's a representation of something that you know has uh, implications on many other levels. Um, this is work I did, uh, I started two years ago, and it's still like in, uh, in progress in a way. I, I mean, every time, I never repeat this work the same, so I change it every time because, because it has potential technically and uh, artistically to be modified. And it's based on very simple idea to vibrate uh, a, a, a mirror vessel with water, just containing water. Again, with low frequency transducer in, the, in this uh, documentation. Um, and it's too close. Sorry. Great, better. Um, so basically, you, you can also, in this case, uh, create standing waves in the, in the, in the vessel and in, on the surface of the water. And um, project a, a 
uh, light uh, from, from laser lights or from underwater high power LEDs to create a light uh, observatory of these waves and uh, um, uh, you can compose we were speaking uh, about uh, instruments uh, our friend was with the, with the cactus and like is this an instrument or not like that's that's the same for us it's like how, how do we uh, when, when we build something like this it's all uh, it's all instruments that don't exist I mean like we build this thing to activate this phenomenon and they end up being sort of instruments that you can actually play so you need time to you know become confident with uh, uh, guided and uh, finally maybe you, 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 you're, you're able to perform with it and it's kind of like it can be very unstable or can be very um, unpredictable uh, but that's what, what makes it even more interesting so every time you actually set up and perform with this it's, uh, it's kind of new and different so this is the case, so the, the waves are projected on, uh, in, in this case, on, uh, this was at the planetarium at Sonic Act. Hi Lucas, <laughs> just arrived. Um, this is another version, more like uh, uh, an installation version that was at the Mercury here, so it's all in Amsterdam. Um, I just want to show you, well, these are, these are the mirrors, so you here you can see that you know they're, they're vibrated low frequency and they are modulated by the sound that you actually hear. The size is, is about 22, 23 centimeters. The diameter it's not so big, but you can make it bigger. I mean, or smaller. It's um, it can be made bigger uh, with the kind of transducer I have. I, I think. I mean, I, I actually did it. I did uh, vibrate. Uh, it was. Less like I think maybe 40, 50 centimeter, and this deep. We did it with Philips Research. Actually, we did some uh, research. I worked for Philips Research for almost five, four or five years, uh, and one of the latest development of our project was to create some uh, ambilight. Maybe some of you are familiar with their idea of ambilight. That it was done totally with analog in analog way with vibrating the water and underwater LEDs and uh, that was also a very interesting uh, research for, for myself like because with them it was very difficult to get into making uh, um, uh, these underwater LEDs because you need to make them small enough to fit like a, a small <coughs> lamp, a small vessel and, uh, or uh, you know you can't put it under like 20 centimeters of water and uh, we, we collaborated with some engineers there but all the attempts we did they, you know we, they only lasted like maybe a few days in the best case sometimes a few hours but I came up with some other idea that they, they didn't think of and actually my LEDs they're still there after being used for many months so <laughs> uh, I will never tell Philips the secret of course but uh, it's interesting that you can actually experiment also with technology and like I, I think here again oh, we are, are we la very late? We are, we're, running, we're running late. Okay, I go very quick. So these are other images. This is, well, we can skip this. It's like why did I call it an harmonium? And these are images again from the... Oh, I'm sorry. This, this one, just quickly, this, this would be a new version with uh, ultrasonic. So instead of vibrating this liquid with uh, infrasonic and modulate it, this will be done with uh, ultrasonic, which uh, I expect and I know already that uh, will work so that the, the wavelength on, of, uh, of the vibration of the water on the surface will be much thinner and the, the, the kind of like design you get out of this moving part and it's much um, more detailed. Uh, well, this is, this is another work uh, uh, still in progress and this will likely also be part of a project I'm doing with Chris in, in Montreal, with, um, uh, hopefully. 
uh, and uh, here there was also uh, planned to use lasers and moving lasers very much like the, the Xanakis uh, work. This was before I knew he was engaging in this kind of things and he had some tests with people. There is a, this platform has tactile sound so you lay on the, on the platform you receive a real uh, sensation of vibration from the sound and lasers. Um, it's more like uh, an environment for uh, light and sound, physical light and sound perception. And, uh, some other research I did was on the uh, stroboscopic light and uh, Dream Machine. I was fascinated by, by of course, the endless amount of, of works, artworks that have been done on the Flickr and, and, uh, and the Dream Machine itself. And, uh, but I, I wanted to investigate more. So, the, the Living Brain is a fantastic book by uh, Gray Walter, which I would recommend everybody to, to read because it's, it's really pioneering many, many of uh, many, many ideas that are now interesting. He, he discovered the alpha uh, rhythms, not the alpha waves, but the alpha rhythms and other things. And out of this uh, research, I thought to, to, to make a piece that was uh, combining the, uh, the flickering light with binaural beats for, a, for an immersive environment, so not uh, with, with four speakers. It's a very unconventional kind of way to, to produce this, but uh, here is I mean, you should see this in complete darkness, and then you start kind of seeing this. I was—I uh, like the idea that the, each viewer would actually see different things, and uh, and I like the idea that because both the the flickering light and the brain, uh, the binaural beats entrain brain waves in different ways. How how would this like one pull from one side and one and the other to the other? How you can play with it? So it's a kind of like another idea of an instrument that plays with your uh, brain waves. And I, I must say it actually worked quite nicely. Um, this is also part of the, uh, this research I, d I did for this piece, like correspondences between uh, frequencies, li light frequencies, sound frequencies, and uh, brain wave frequencies. So there are studies about this. Also, you know, it's all kind of borderline science. It's not that, you know, normal scientists will engage in this kind of research, but I think it's really worth to, to have a look at this and try out things, experiment. So it's all about, you know, experimenting and seeing what is really there. Um, so just to finish, and I'm done, <laughs> Uh, there, there has been, you know, for us a shift uh, uh, between, you know, working on this media to this post media. Uh, there was more this synesthetic uh, media, sound specialization, into this new uh, uh, domain, like that, you know, comprises so many different elements. So here we go for, for what I call like complexity, but. Uh, and what I also call the spectral sensorium. So it's um, just neologism, just invented for this, but uh, it explains this idea that everything we, we actually investigate has to do with some sort of vibrational phenomena and of, uh, with perception. So at the end, we you know, branch our uh, activities into and uh, research into many, many uh, fields and uh, we hope to do more and more of this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so her focus is on, on a lot on performance, on, on the role of the body, uh, electromagnetic fields, and uh, she as well is going to talk about her work. Thank you. I'm waiting for the slides to come. Yep, there yeah. they so, yeah, I got it. Thank you. So, I choose this title uh, is uh, usually, I choose this title because uh, if you read it, it, uh, it really highlights uh, what are my interests. So, my interest is in space, is in body, is in human senses, and is uh, in uh, giving a kind of new way of understanding interaction. 
in contemporary art. If I fit in this panel, I fit because of optophonica, but I also fit because uh, I think that the physical reality is much more complex than what we can uh, sense and perceive. And my work is all uh, about that, in fact. Um, so I was trained as an architect, and uh, you know how much is uh, important space for uh, an architect, and how you uh, m melt everything around you in a kind of fluid uh, environment that uh, you can, in fact, control as an architect. They say our architects are quite arrogant, much more than engineers, for example, they say. But I was never interested in building spaces, but in the way we experience space. And that's where the body comes in uh, very suddenly, right? So I'm going to go very fast, because I think we are quite late. So. I wrote it all down, so we can kind of, uh, I hope that if I go fast, you can understand what I want to say thanks to my slides. So how we sense, how we experience, how we perceive, how we build the bottom-up process from, senses to the, from the sensory system to our brain, which organize and then we perceive things. This is really my, the core of my interest. So in fact, how we build our consciousness. Thanks to that, we map the world around us, right? So I'm in fact interested in knowing everything, how we understand the world around us, thanks to that is our emotional world, which I'm very caring about, and of course, how we interact with each other. So human, for me, are still very much important. That's the only entity I know, in fact. Uh, so if I have to resume what is my work about, it is about this. It's against any rational idea of objective space and body. Uh, and uh, let's say I create the immersive spaces. And on the work, you know, we have been speaking about responsive, interactive, uh, immersive. <coughs> At the end, uh, all comes down to the way we sense and perceive. Then uh, definition about spaces is about uh, how you feel in that, right? Uh, as I said, it's very important communication for me, for emotional states. And this is why I kind of believe that individual don the individual beings does not emerge in isolation. Thinking about space, I will just make a, a very. Uh, I go back uh, uh, when I said that I am trained as an architect. When you are trained as an architect, in my age, not right now, luckily, because uh, digital computing did. Uh, gave a lot to architecture, and you know all about algorithmic architecture, etc. Um, when you are an architect, they give you a pen, at that, at that time it was a pen, not even a computer, and they say on the white paper, you now draw what you think the shape needs to be in that spot. That's a quite a, a, a control from a human being on the space itself. You can imagine that the space is considered as a, a receiver, right? A passive entity where you as human mind have the control to say, here goes this. That was the architecture since 20, till 20 years ago. And is still right now if it's a bad architecture. If you instead uh, believe in the space as a completely generation, generators and as it is physically, the space where the most uh, um, uh, complex fluctuations of energy are happening, then you can never do this because your hand will go like this, you know? Everything around is a wave. Right? So we have to think about building spaces in this way. Of course, in the moment that the space is like this, also the observer is not anymore an observer, right? But it's part of it. Everything is a wave. We are also like uh, inflicting in between. This is like the particles. They are not different from the space around. And uh, 
we are the same than the particles, right? So the new physics told us so many things about space that that's the way now we have to think about space and what Tetz was speaking about, about to try to visualize the phenomena which are not, uh, for example, visible to us. Let's say the truth, we are wonderful uh, uh, systems. I don't want to say machines because we go in, on another level of discussion, but in fact, we do beautiful things. We transform electromagnetic waves, uh, wavelength in colors. We transform vibration in sound. We transform a chemical reaction in smell. There is a, now it's not so bad anymore. The smell, here. but uh, uh, they don't exist in fact outside our brain. We we construct uh, in real time, all the time, all this. So let's think about the space in that way. Let's think about our body in this way. And that's where a new art can emerge to help us to perceive new things that in this uh, Newton might say in the mechanical everyday life we cannot perceive. I will go on uh, a bit more. Uh, I want, okay, then I go just one second. I make an example on the space, but this is a very old one, so please forgive me. But I'm very attached to it because it's my first, it's my first model where I understood that I was, a, I kind of took the right way. Right, because I had, uh, when I was a student, I had a lot of thoughts and I didn't know uh, where to tunnel them, right? Uh, so this is the first model that gave me a bit of a breath and, uh, and the, the phrase that comes is the movement comes before space. If you don't have a movement, there is no space. Um, and this is uh, called uh, Iceland. Isola in Italian, and uh, this is an algorithmic uh, model uh, which came from the idea, let's say I love the sea, of course, I am from South Italy, I am born in the sea, in fact, and uh, let's uh, make um, uh, something that is very rigid, let's just put it in the water, imagine if everything I comprised myself, that was the idea, I could just shape myself with the waves of the sea. So thanks to environmental conditions, which then form an algorithm, this was uh, the result. Very slow, <laughs> to let you see. 